Hello and welcome everyone to another episode of the New York Fishing Podcast. Today we will be talking about the ghost pots which are lining the Long Island Sound. This is a serious issue. There are estimated to be between 800,000 and 1.3 million of these pots, most of which were left behind after the collapse of the lobster. So while everyone is getting ready to get out fishing, which I hope you're doing because things have been pretty hot this week, I want you to listen in on this ghost pot issue because we're going to need folks to help us get these things out of the Long Island Sound. I'd like to introduce our guest, Scott Curatolo Wagaman. He is a senior resource educator at Cornell Cooperative Extension in Suffolk County and is the director of fisheries of the fisheries department within the marine program. Uh, this, this guest is exciting to me in that um, he's like looking at all these things that I'm always concerned with when it comes to fisheries management and just our overall fisheries. So, Scott, please uh, explain to people how what you do is different in that you actually you're hands on. You know, the biggest uh, biggest complaint most anglers have is that they're getting directions from people sitting behind a desk, you know. So, I mean, you're actually hands on. So if you could explain to the folks uh, what you do and what your team does. Yeah, certainly. And and, and thanks for having me on the podcast, George. It's uh, it's an honor. I've had yeah, to listen to you. a few of them, you know, it's, uh, yeah, I'm very excited to be here and, and glad you invited me. Um, so if part of what we do goes back to the cooperative extension system itself. Um, each of the counties within New York has a cooperative extension, uh, Cornell being the land grant um, university for New York. And most of the cooperative extensions deal with horticulture, agriculture, um, some environmental problems. Um, and then 30 odd years ago, some researchers realized that, you know, kind of the same sort of issues they were seeing in the agriculture industry could be directly related to things in the fishing industry Industry. here in New York (laughs) and Suffolk County, you know, we're surrounded by water Nassau County surrounded by water. So 30 odd years ago, the Marine program here at Cornell Cooperative Extension of Suffolk County was initiated. And in general, we've been kind of focused on five different program areas. We do youth education. We do habitat restoration uh, things like seal, uh, eelgrass. Um, we do shellfish restoration. You know, I know you've had uh, Dr. Tattle back on, uh, so we've been doing things. You know, for the bay scallops and the baconics, um, different townships with clams and oysters. Um, we also do water quality, so we do a lot of stormwater remediation. Um, work with municipalities and help them. Um, deal with the stormwater regulations that the EPA and the state have. <laughs> um, and then we, ha- we have fisheries. Um, so most of my early part of the career, I w- was with the water quality was a little bit of fisheries. And about 10 years ago, I started becoming more interested in fisheries. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'd always kind of worked a little bit on some projects here and there, but it was never enough at the time to really get involved. You know, they, they would need an extra person to go out on a boat to go diving or, you know, to just measure fish. And, you know, my interest was there, but it, it hadn't been peaked yet. Um, so about 10 years ago is when I started becoming more involved. And what makes a lot of our projects rewarding is that, again, going back to the dynamic of the cooperative extension where they're working with the farmers in the agriculture department. What sets us apart from just basic research is that we just about always have a cooperative research project with the industry. 
um, fishing industry. Mostly we've been working with commercial in- industry, but we also do things with the recreational. Um, it's just, you know, the the nature of some of the you know projects we have, the interests of the researchers and some of what the industry has come to us with. So a lot of the ideas we have aren't even generated from us. They're ones that the industry sees either, you know, through regulations or, you know, designing new bycatch gear that, you know, may be trialed over in Europe, but it hasn't been approved here in the United States. Right, right. So, yeah, they come to us, you know, and we have been fairly successful with some federal grant programs. So we kind of know where a specific idea may be the best fit for federal funding. Well, there you have it, folks. Let's get those fish killers out of the Long Island Sound. Thanks for listening all. Please subscribe to the channel. I could use all the support I could get as I try to advocate for the recreational angler and the recreational fishing industry. And with always the resource in mind, you can see me or see me, visit me over at myangler.com. I'm there each and every day along with a group of really fine, knowledgeable fishermen and fishing ladies. That's why we call it New York Angler. Well, I'll see you folks soon. I have episode after episode that I'll be pumping out. Good luck, good fishing, and I hope uh, you guys and gals get out there soon and enjoy what's soon to be the best fishing New York has to offer. In advice, and you've actually applied it. Okay, and one of the the you know best ones, and you know I believe it's the one you had taken the most interest in, or when you contacted me, is our derelict lobster program. Um, you know, back in ninety nine two thousand, there was the catastrophic lobster die off in the Long Island Sound. Um, you know, at, at the height of the lobster industry between Connecticut. And New York, you know, there were permits for, I think it was just under 500,000 traps when you know, tags were issued that year. So that was kind of the high watermark, I believe, for trap fishing for lobsters. And then you had the die off. And then what you saw was, you know, guys getting out of the industry. Um, and sometimes what happened was, yeah, you know, storms. There were lost traps. Um, sometimes there were guys who were just casually fishing. Yeah, they had a commercial license, but they weren't necessarily, you know, commercial lobstering was not their full time job. There were but, a lot yeah, of those had, back then. <laughs> yeah, I, so, I remember all that. So, so what happened is, is you know, it, real estate's money, and you know, you had guys kind of either leaving them there knowing they weren't going to come back or at least like, you know what, next year is going to be better. I'm just going to leave my traps out there. And then, you know, by the time it was a full on realization that the lobster population within the Long Island Sound was not coming back. A lot of them, a lot of guys was like, I don't even remember where I had my traps and you know, the buoys have long since gone and you know, they just weren't there. All but right. Listen, few- Scott, you're a, you sound like a really good guy, and you, but you're kind of going around and around. No offense. Let's face it. I mean, I get it. They probably they were hurting bad enough as it was. The lobsters all died. They're all gone. Um, so they just in most and I'm not trying to knock anybody, but this is what happened. They, they left them there. And in some cases, I'm sure they, you know, they did lose the buoys or whatever. But right. in many cases, they did leave them there. So, right. you know, we got to call a spade a spade, so to speak. So, um, but yeah. And again, I'm not saying it. But look, I just see irony in that. When I first looked you up, right, I, I was reading some stuff and, you know, I saw how I think we're working somehow with Connecticut on this or they're doing what or we're doing what they're doing or um, Mm -hmm. and I was like the answer's got to be we're going to pay the same people that left them. We're going to pay them to get them out because they're the only ones that know where they are. So is that what's happening? I mean to cut through all the chase of you know how we get there. But 
Right. Yes and no. So you see, the issue was, and this was, you know, eventually the, the issue with Connecticut. And I actually don't remember what it was in New York, but eventually the guys who had stayed in the industry had said, like, look, you know, we're trying to set our traps. We there's lots of traps out there that just are not being used. We're either towing them to an area we know is there's hangs. Just mm-hmm. to get them out of the way, mm-hmm. so they had come to us and said, "Look, you know, we'd like to develop a program where we can remove these traps." Oh, okay. And unfortunately, I don't know what it was in New York. I know for Connecticut, it took them a while to change their laws because it had to do with private property hmm. that you couldn't just pull them up. That makes sense. So, regardless, I know you know for New York. The program had started before I was involved, but, you know, I know what our letter from the DEC says. And the only, you know, the lobstermen that we work with are ones who still have a current lobster license and are in good standing. Okay. So that's. That matters. I guess. The question about, you know, <laughs> yeah. guys going out and getting their, their, their traps that they put out there. So, so. Um, Go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. Yeah, but it's always been a cooperative, you know, the industry came to us and we started, you know, some pilot projects just to see what was out there because we didn't know. Right. Um, And then it's been a lot of cooperation with either municipalities because the other issue is that once we grapple these and we pull them up, um, we've got to contact the fishermen to see if they want their traps back. So we have to hold the traps for 30 days in case the the fishermen would like to reclaim their traps. In most cases, you know, these traps have been buried for over 10 years. They're not in any functional shape. Um, So in most cases they say they, you know, they don't want them. So again, we've worked with a lot of municipalities so that we have a staging area where we can kind of keep some traps. Um, again, you know, it's been a lot of like balancing acts and learning over time and the success of the project like early on, we would have to pay for a metal recycling company, you know, you, you know, a dumpster. It's um, always costs, off. right? Yeah. But eventually they realized that this was such a great program that, they provided match. So in, you know, in other words, they weren't charging us, they were doing it for the project. And usually that's what is required in some of these um, federal grants is Mm -hmm. that, you know, there may be say 50% match where if we're looking, you know, to do a project of a hundred thousand dollars, we've got to essentially come up with a hundred and fifty thousand dollar project where $50,000 then is match. So again, where that comes in is the metal recycling company, you know, providing, donating the in-kind services of, you know, a dumpster and picking up and, you know, removing that dumpster. The municipalities come down once the dumpster's um, delivered to the port, you know, they come down and they load the dumpster with the traps and then they'll crush them with the front end loader. Again, all things that, you know, are, they're not charging to the grant, but they're providing those services. So that's how this pro- program has been able to go for, I think we've been doing it for 11 years. So um, can I ask how many, I have, I have a few, few questions. I, I'm sure that these pots that you're finding, even though they're old, 10 years old, whatever, mm-hmm. most of these pots are killing fish. Am I correct? I mean, I could see it's like a cycle, right? A fish goes in, it dies, and another yes. fish goes in to eat that dead fish or whatever. Yes, and it's called ghost fishing. Yeah. Um, yeah and I have to see. I know at one point, one of our projects, we were seeing about it was like 25 or 30, 30% were ghost fishing. So that we would pull up a, a pot and there was some sort of you know, live animal in it. Right. Uh, most of them fish, but sometimes, you know, lobsters, sometimes, you know, uh, get a lot of spider crabs. Right. Um, but yes, fin fish we're getting in there and we've been trying to, that's kind of the next step of funding that we've been looking at is seeing if there's a way we can see what that rate of ghost fishing is. So it would have to be, you know, designing some sort of project where there's like an underwater camera and, you know, use a baited trap and just record, 
over a certain period of time how much is getting in there so that we can start to see you know you know what is the that rate of ghost fishing because we don't know right you know we, we pull up an empty trap okay good that one you know counts towards the 75 percent that wasn't ghost fishing but if we picked it up yesterday maybe it did or last right. week maybe it was you know the same thing with the ones we are finding maybe that one has never ghost fished before but just happened to have one that day yeah yeah no i i can i can see that but uh, all right so so it, it, you know they are killing fish I, i'm not trying to make this like uh you know, like this is the end of the world. But the truth is, I feel that, you know, once the lobsters, uh, you know, died, once I had to die off, a lot of those guys started targeting blackfish. And, you know, the price right now of a live blackfish, I mean, you're not supposed to sell them in New York. Uh, but if you walk around into, you know, into the city, into various markets, you could find them at live blackfish is five dollars a pound. So, oh, I'm sorry, twenty five dollars a pound. So, a five pound fish is like one hundred and twenty five bucks. So, you know, when you have that kind of price tag on a fish, they, you know, they were getting targeted, and at the same time, you had the ghost pots, which we don't know how many of those were killing blackfish. You know, I, I was at the table literally when we wrote the uh, Blackfish bill and we mm. made the commercial limit 25 fish a boat. And at the time, we weren't going to allow and we could have got to push through. We weren't even going to allow potting at all for Blackfish. But the lobstermen requested, look, we, we get a bycatch. We get a couple, you know, here and there. But it does help, you know, help us. So we were like, all right. You know, you could keep your bycatch. And then that turned into a targeted fishery. Hmm. So, you know, so how many pots do you think there are out there? So if there were 500,000 permits, is that, that, is that what we said? There must well, be a lot of pots. You know, tags. So, yeah, um, it, it's easily we can say there's tens of thousands out there because we've over the 11 years, we've pulled 21,000 out. And that's just on the New York side. Wow. Um, so, you know, we, we've, we're trying to go into different areas. Uh, the issue that we're kind of running into now is because of the DC permit and the stipulations I mentioned before that you know, we've got to use a lobsterman who still has a valid permit and is a good standing. A lot of, again, a lot of the industry here is left. And there's not too many lobstermen out there. So we're kind of limited by the ports that we're operating out of. So, you know, we've done a good cleanup within central Long Island Sound. You know, mm -hmm. there could be other areas. You know, we're always finding other areas that we hadn't been to before. Um, but, you know, western Long Island and eastern Long Island, we really have not done that much out there just because, again, trying to find a fisherman who fits those requirements it's tough. You know, we've had some guys that we've worked with, you know, say out of uh, Mount Sinai, you know, it, it's the cost of fuel is getting a lot. So they've been willing to go further west or east of where they normally would have gone. But now, you know, fuel being what it is. And again, these projects being, you know, the fishermen putting in some match, you know, it's, it's becoming economically tough to keep that portion up without finding other participants. So, um, so you get this grant. It just seems to me, isn't there a way that uh, someone could say to DEC, "Look, we can't, we can't find anybody, but we have this money. We need to do this work." You know, was there someone else we could hire? I mean, I got to give you an example. There's a friend of mine. Uh, his name is John Skinner. You could. Mm -hmm. He's he's got a ton of YouTube videos. Yes, and. In many of those underwater videos, now there's a guy going out wreck fishing, right? You know, recreational fishing. Right. And that drone, up oh, there's a ghost pot. I've seen at least three times where his drone has picked up ghost pots. Right. So I'm, why aren't we like employing new technology where, you know, we don't have to depend on everybody? I mean, with, with the sonar and everything we have now... <laughs> You could pick out a five-inch rock on the bottom of the... Yeah, no, and we are. We are starting to 
you know, it was now that we're getting Connecticut on board, Connecticut is just starting their program. Um, you know, they decided, you know, they did want to reinvent the wheel. We've been doing this for a while. So they are patterning their program after what we've been doing here. Oh, okay. Um, so they're just getting started. Um, some of their projects, they have been able to um, get some side scan sonar. We actually have a current project that we're hopefully starting within a month or so that was based upon some side scan sonar um, of some in- images in Oyster Bay. Mm-hmm. Um, the issue, though, is you know making sure we don't know if they are right. lobster pots for sure or if they're you know they could be whelk pots. Right. Yeah, you, there's so many variables, and I get that. And, it, you know, that was a problem originally, and I guess still is kind of, in that there is no real definition of a blackfish pot. It's still, you know, it's still basically a lobster a lobster pot. So, um, but, hey, it is, it is what it is when it comes to that. But the bottom line is the blackfish, I mean, the blackfish fishery, the talk fish fishery is coming back, but it's a much, you know, it, 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 the, the fishery is being managed to keep a lot of small fish, you mm-hmm. know. Um, and it, it's kind of working in that regard. But there's the number of big breeders that we used to see, they're just not around. And, you know, I, I don't believe in coincidence. As the price goes up on any fishery, we used to see that with striped bass. Mm. Um, you know, the fishery hurts. And because not everybody's honest. Most people are, but not everyone, not everyone is. And there's so many different ways to push these fish out onto the market. But so it's great that you guys are doing this. It really is. You know, like I had no clue when I always wondered, like I used to fish the shore and pipeline. I don't know if you you guys did any work there, but that thing is just lined from one end to the other with pots. I, there are no fish left there for recreational anglers. So, but I'm wondering how many of those are, are ghost or, you know, how many down there. You know, I always think about the areas I fish, you know, I fish in Smithtown Bay and all throughout that area. And, you know, you're fluking, you're snagging a pot. It happens. Happens Mm -hmm. quite often. So, but all right. So now what else, uh, what else are you guys uh, doing? Or maybe, maybe, look, let me me change this a little bit. (laughs) So what is your uh, opinion on the changing of our waters here in New York and specifically in the sound, because I kind of feel like the sound is warming faster. You know, we have a lot of people that are listening to this thing that they kind of deny that things are happening. Um, But the truth is they are, I don't know what's causing it, but it's happening. So what are your uh, how do you feel? I mean, like, since I was a child, I saw, you see, Tommy Cotton sound, you know, mackerel runs. We had dolphin all over the place. I mean, there were, it was a totally different fishery. We had, you know, black, uh, you know, nice winter flounder. Um, but we didn't have sea bass, right? We didn't have a lot of fluke. We didn't. Right. So so what, what do you think is happening? It's just a lot of it, I think, is just... You know, with the the waters changing, the you know temperature, you know we're seeing different stocks. And you know, besides the lobster stuff, you know we we haven't really done much in Long Island Sound. Um, a little bit, you know, we, we do a a striped bass specific project for the DEC right now. Um, but like you said, you know, you're seeing more black sea bass. You know, they're coming up. Um, you know, we, we, you're hearing of other species that have been managed, you know, with the different councils, you know, species that are now used to be controlled by the Mid-Atlantic Council are now moving up to New England, you know, and the same thing with, you yeah. know, we've got, you know, Southern Atlantic Council fish moving up to Mid-Atlantic. And some of the issues are, are going to be that, you know, some of those decisions need to be changed because then you get... A, an area who, you know, a council who's doing regulations for a fish that's no longer in their area. 
Um, yeah. So I think that's going to have to be, uh, you know, a big change coming up. Well, um, that at least has to be talked about either the councils or the commission. Um, yeah. I, you know, a good example of that is Florida having a vote in striped bass. <laughs> they don't they don't get right. striped bass down there. Yeah. Um, but, you know, because it's the East Coast. So but in any case, so. So you're doing all this great work around Long Island. How big is your team? And and do you advise or you're just on the you're just doing the work to get results? We're doing it. You know, again, we've we've been working with a lot of these partners for 30 plus years. Um, So we're kind of in a way invested, you know, in their future and our future as well. Um, You know, so like the striped bass, that was one of the recreational projects we did, you know, when it was first started to see that, you know, there was maybe some measures going to come down back in 2018 um, you know, we applied for a grant to do some just recreational striped bass information from New York, you know, knowing that at some point there were going to be some new regulations. And then eventually it did hit that, you know, you had to use circle hooks for live bait, um, different handling techniques for best management pra- practices. Um, but recently we've been also doing a project for the DEC because it's been quite a long time since they've done any PCB analysis on striped bass. Very interesting. I'm going to have to so follow up with you on that. <laughs> we, have, we started last year. Um, and again, the DEC knows that we've got great relationships with the commercial and recreational for hire industry, specifically in this case, where we've been able to collect striped bass samples from five different geographic areas around Long Island and collect monthly samples of striped bass so they can analyze them for stripe for uh, PCB concentrations to see if things have gotten better so that maybe they can open up more areas that have been closed. Yeah, and this we year all knew that was coming. You mean the yeah. invisible line? Oh, it's out there, at the magical line where the, the fish go past it, right? East Rockaway. If they're headed, right. if they're headed uh, east, they get magically cleaned, and yes. if they go west, <laughs> they get all of a sudden they're loaded with PCBs. I, I yes. don't know which one it is. I remember one time they were considering different sides of the river to make them. Because some fish in the Hudson had less PCBs than the other ones. I'm like, wait a minute. I mean, these fish are going all <laughs> over the place. Give me. But, yeah, so that's pretty interesting. I suspected that they would, you know, start looking at that because, you know, I, I don't know how I feel about it. But, you know, they, they got a certain number of tags and that's it. I've, I've learned over the years that, yeah, it is poaching involved. But when it comes to striped bass... You know, they're pretty strict. So I, I think that's the, the one fishery that we don't really have to worry about that much as far as the health of the stock and, you know, what the Hudson's producing. Yeah. So, all right. Look, okay. Scott, I don't want to uh, keep you tied up all day here, and I really do appreciate this. No, I and appreciate gonna, having me on. We're going to talk again, again and I'm going to find out. You know. Go ahead. Got a staff of, I think you would ask that question, but I currently have a staff of 10. Um, You know, a lot of it is we wrote a lot during COVID when we couldn't, you know, do much field work. We wrote a lot. And, you know, at the time during COVID, we were staff of five. um, And we've doubled. We currently have, you know, 11 different projects. So, you know, basically I've described two or three of the projects we're working on <laughs> you know we've got several local seafood projects that you know we're trying to get people to eat more local seafood well that's, um, that's you know great. and then a lot of gear adaptation stuff that we do you know up and down just looking at different gear to you know help reduce bycatch or increase targeted catch for you know different fisheries so scott there is one thing i did want to mention so mm-hmm. you have you're reaching out to party boats, right? And you're reaching out to commercial fishermen. 
Has have you guys ever considered actually reaching out to recreational fishermen? There are plenty of recreational fishermen that can give you a ton of information. Like you're not yeah. getting you're not getting any fish from the surf, right? So it's I mean, we're here and we would love right. to be a part of it. And I know that um, we have actually, you know. OK, know, that's great. Know, that's great. There was actually, a, you know, a fishing club on the North Shore, uh, you know, in Suffolk County that had uh, contacted us. And I think we had put in for uh, this either marine debris or actually it may have been uh, expansion of the artificial reef years ago when the DEC was doing that. So, yeah, no, we, we've always been, you know, trying to fit recreational stuff in. Um, yeah, because we're here. We're here to help. Yeah. We always seem to get like, well, people always overlook us. <laughs> right. And with a striped bass one, we, again, sometimes it comes down to regulations. We can't, we were trying to figure that out with our, you know, our current project with the striped bass PCB being that now we're going to be, you know, sampling both Long Island waters this year uh at the beginning of the year and then all of kind of the western new york embayments throughout the year uh you know if there was any wiggle room with the recreational industry um you know while we can't you know that we do have funds that cover some of the the costs um you know for recreational what we can work out is if guys are interested in taking us out they know where the fish are you know, there's something we can work out where we pay for bait or we pay for some fuel or something like that. So that's one of the ways we're trying to get more participants, more stakeholders involved with that particular project. Well, that's great. I mean, if you could email me something, if you have anything uh, regarding mm-hmm. those uh, programs, I could link them up on our website and get the okay. word out through our social media. Yep. And because because I know people would just love to be involved. Now, I would be remiss not to pass this last hot potato by you. Do you have any comment on the whales that are washing ashore and the overall effect of the windmills? What you when I I look at it, I see windmills in the path of these whales. You know, they're putting them right in the migration path. But I know I kind of know where you are and what you do. And it may not be easy for you to comment. Right. All, all I know is that, you know, I, I've been trying to keep up on it. And this morning I was reading something that was linked through, you know, a fishery website that, you know, I guess the official word on some of the ones that were found this weekend were vessel strikes. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree. But how come no one ever mentions is the, they seem to be more vessel strikes, so maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think I am. Maybe they're being disoriented, and that's why they're getting whacked by ships. No one ever brings that point up. Right. And the other thing is someone's got to tell these people, you know, oh, you know, climate change is not the biggest threat to the whales. They've mm-hmm. been here for 50 minutes. They've been through a lot of cooling and warming, right. and we're the only threat right now. But anyway, I'm, I, I had to get that out. <laughs> I, I have to, I've been all over, you know, all over. It's from the beginning, from two years ago. You know, they laid it all out. They laid it all out. But anyway, Scott, you are a great guest, and I am going to yep. have you on. And, and when do you think you're going to have that uh, PCB uh, study complete? I'd love to touch base with you. Well, <laughs> if you're again, allowed to, it's, it's always. You know, I can tell you that you know we'll be done. Cornell's involvement, as far as working with the industry and obtaining the samples and working the samples up, you know, you know, we're done this year. As for the analysis, that's out of our hands. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Good enough. I'll. Uh, I, I got enough people I speak to over there. They'll give it to yeah, us. Yeah, and you we, know, straight you know, from the horse. Get, we, we, we try to pass on to the industry as much as we know. Well, that's great. Scott, look, I, you know, I appreciate you taking the time and explaining to our audience that there are people out there that actually work with the industry and recreational yep. fishermen. I'm yep. glad you brought that up. And that you're working on getting those pots, those ghost pots that we're all, you know, we all know what's going on. We've all snagged one. We've all seen yep. it. So... Uh, keep up the good work with that. Yeah, and, and again, that's another thing. You know, if if you or your listeners, again, you, you know of a specific place, you guys have the knowledge. And again, that's how we started this with the commercial industry. They knew where pots were. 
And, you know, if, if we can put something together, again, you've got video, then that just can certainly go into a grant submission. And, you know, well, let that, you know there's that probably going to be a Long Island Sound Future Funds grant coming up within the next month. They're going to announce that. So that would be the perfect opportunity that, you know, if you've got some good sonar images or drone images or anything oh that yeah kind of have drone. An area where there's <laughs> pots you know that, that 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 will help a proposal and you know help the uh the chances that it'll get funded absolutely picture is as they say a thousand words and it's not nothing truer than that when it comes to fisheries because yeah. people you know fish are under the water they never see what's going on uh if you give them actual video and they see this fish trapped in a pot being killed they're gonna think differently so mm-hmm. all right scott look thanks so again send me whatever you have yep. and i'll get it up on our website and i'll also you know, be reaching out to some of our uh, friends, you know, recreational uh, folks that I think might be interested in, in helping out with this. Yep, great. All right. So thanks again, Scott. Appreciate it. Thank we'll you, talk again soon. Thanks. Okay. Thank Alrighty, you. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, there you have it, folks. Let's get those fish killers out of the Long Island Sound. Thanks for listening all. Please subscribe to the channel. I could use all the support I could get as I try to advocate for the recreational angler and the recreational fishing industry. And with always the resource in mind, you can see me or see me, visit me over at myangler.com. I'm there each and every day along with a group of really fine, knowledgeable fishermen and fishing ladies. That's why we call it New York Angler. Well, I'll see you folks soon. I have episode after episode that I'll be pumping out. Good luck, good fishing, and I hope uh, you guys and gals get out there soon and enjoy what's soon to be the best fishing New York has to offer.